All right, so now we're gonna go over some helicopter specific sections. Now, I don't know too much about helicopters, but there are some helicopter specific sections that we need to go over. Most of this was added with acceleration. Prior to acceleration, there really wasn't that much for helicopters, but acceleration added a few new things. So before we go over the this stuff over here, let's talk about this easier to do stuff. So the helicopter section is its own section in the CFG file, as you can see, brackets, helicopter. And these are the different uh, parts of that section you can have. So lift arrow center, this is the longitudinal position in feet from the datum of the helicopter that represents the vertical aerodynamic center. You only define its point longitudinally, all right? It's not a three position coordinates like before, it's just the longitudinal axis. Remember, longitudinal, lateral, and vertical. All right, keep that in mind. Now, low, re low realism stability center. This is a scalar of the stability of the helicopter, but you can set it to 1.0 or zero and forget about it because it only applies to the default Bell 206. I don't know why that is oddly specific, but for some reason it only applies to that helicopter. Now, reference length, this is the length of the helicopter in feet. Reference frontal area. This is the cross section area of the fuselage in feet squared. Uh, reference side area, total side area area of the fuselage in feet squared. Side arrow center, the longitudinal position in feet from the datum that represents the lateral aerodynamic center. Right trim scalar, the scalar of the effect, the scalar on the effect of the trim that counters dissymmetry of lift. Correlator available, a flag, so zero or one, determines if the collective throttle correlator is configured on the helicopter. Governed percent RPM ref defines the percent RPM that the governor attempts to maintain, 1.0 equals 100%. Governor PID, this is proportional integral derivative feedback controller that works to maintain the reference RPM. So it looks like you have one, two, three, four, five numbers here. The first number, proportional controller constant. Second number, integral controller constant. Third number, derivative controller constant. Fourth number, max RPM error. And five, fifth number, max RPM error where 1.0 equals 100%. Are those two the same? Next, we have rotor brake scalar set to uh, zero if you don't want a rotor brake. This is a scalar on the effectiveness of the rotor brake. Torque scalar, scalar on the effect that the rotor has on yawing moment of the aircraft or of the helicopter. Cyclic roll control scalar, scalar of the amount of control or roll control authority from lateral movement of the cyclic. And another one of those for pitch. Pedal control scalar, the scalar on the amount of yaw control authority from the movement of the anti-torque pedals. Collective on rotor torque scalar, the scalar on the amount of torque exerted on the rotor system due to the collective pitch of the rotor blades. Now we also have some coefficients for fuselage aerodynamics. We have drag force, side drag force, pitch dampener, pitch damp, roll damp, yaw damp, and yaw stability. Then we can define some stuff about the main rotor. So starting with acceleration, if you ever see something in red here, it means it was added with acceleration. Uh, static pitch angle when the stick is centered and static bank angle when the stick is uh, centered. These are the banks and these are the pitch and bank angle that the rotor disc will be when you have the cyclic centered. Uh, position, this is the datum reference or position relative to the datum reference point uh, the center of the main rotor. Radius of the main rotor in feet. Max disc angle, the maximum absolute deflection up or down in degrees that the rotor disc can move with the cyclic. Rated RPM, the rated RPM values for the main rotor. Number of blades. Weight per blade, approximate weight in pounds of each rotor blade. Maximum moment of inertia factor. 
or weight to MOI factor, sorry, the constant used in calculating the moment of inertia of the rotor disc, the MOI algorithm is a, is a function of the number of blades, their weight, and this constant. Increasing this constant will increase the inertia of the disc. And the inflow velocity reference. The reference inflow velocity of air mass moving through the rotor disc, increasing this value will result in more thrust being generated. Now, we can also define the secondary rotor. Uh, the position of the secondary rotor, a flag set to 1 if it's a tail rotor, like on the Bell 206 or the R22, or 0 if it's an anti-torque rotor. Think of uh, the CH47, where you have a front rotor and a back rotor. They both spin in different directions, but they're both vertical. That's an anti-torque rotor. And then radius, this is the radius of the rotor in feet. Now, moving back up here, we see we have a sling and a turboshaft engine. These were added with acceleration. So turboshaft engine would take the, the place of turbo prop or whatever engine when you use helo turbine engine, you would add this section. And it's pretty much the same as turbo prop. You got a power scaler, maximum torque, and power specific fuel consumption. We've already gone over that with the engines. Now up here, the sling section. This can be, um, used to define sling positions on the aircraft or the rotorcraft. Uh, you can have multiple sling positions. So when you define it, you put brackets sling dot in, and then you put uh, presumably a zero or a one, two for which sling you want it to be. So a hoist extend and retract rate in feet per second. This is the extension and retraction rate of the hoist. The position relative to the datum reference point of the, uh, the hoist. The maximum stretch distance at ultimate load, this is how much the cord will stretch when you have ultimate load on the, uh, the, um, the sling. The dampening ratio, zero for no dampening, one for a critically dampening. Uh, this is the dampening of the uh, sling. Rated load, characteristics of tension of cable in pounds. So this is the rated load of the cable, basically. The ultimate load, this is the braking force in pounds that cannot exceed 10,000. Tolerance angle, the angle in degrees used to determine lateral braking force limit. Auto pickup range, max range in feet of auto pickup. Auto pickup max speed, maximum speed feet per second for auto pickup. Hoist payload station. Payload station in which the hoist will load in and out of. So when you pick stuff up with the hoist and put it in your helicopter, it puts weight onto the helicopter into one of the payload stations. You put a number here to specify which payload station it is. So uh, if you put a one here, that's station zero. I don't know why it didn't just go with the same numbers as which one, but one is station zero. 2 is station 1, 3 is station 2, and so on. So that basically just specifies where you want the weight from the hoist to be. Hoist door, this is the door associated with the hoist, must be open for use. So hoist, if you can see on the example EH101, hoist door equals 1. So the first door, door 1, has to be open on in order to use the hoist on the H101. And that's how that works. All right, so one last thing I wanna talk about and that is textures. Now you may notice there's always a texture folder and then there's texture folders with a dot followed by a name. For the default planes, it's gonna be a number, but for add-on planes like say uh, the F-16, you can see it's got a name here. Uh, texture Thunderbird, Texture C Pit, AM Pit, all that. So what does this got to do with anything? Well, I want to show you a trick. Notice that here, there's a lot of textures. Here, there's only a few. So if we look in the texture folder, we see there are 19 different items. We see a texture CFG, a thumbnail, plus the different DDS files. Texture 1 only has four. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, the way this works is that it looks in the texture folder all the time, the main one, the one that doesn't have a name behind it. 
This is usually where you'll find the base texture, which for the default planes is usually a, uh, a zero. Uh, for most of them, it's gonna be their white texture, but uh, in the case of the Caravan, it's the Global Freightways texture. So this means that you only have to specify certain files that are gonna be different. So you don't have to paint everything for every plane. So it, the prop spinner, for example, it's always gonna be a bright gray on most airplanes. So you put that texture in here. And as you can see, the prop C208, it's right there. And the only ones that are in the other folders are the ones that change the paint job. So this one is the white with the red stripe. And this is where you put it. Now what's on the texture CFG file? Uh, this is just some fallback textures. I really don't know what they do. Every single one says the same thing. Uh, the last one is the thumbnail. The thumbnail has to be a JPEG image. Recommend you make it small, 256 by 128, just like the default ones. But you don't have to. It seems the sim will resize textures appropriately. People, thumbnails are not hard to get, and it's always disappointing when I download a new plane and it doesn't have a thumbnail. These are really not difficult to get at all, guys. They're just JPEG images. Name them thumbnail, no caps, and make them a reasonable size. You don't want to go too big here. Uh, 256 by 128 works. That's the ideal size, but you can make it whatever. It seems the sim will resize as needed. And that's all I can think of. That about covers it. So that is... I guess that's designing an airplane for Flight Sim X tutorial in a way, but it was supposed to be just going over different CFG files. Or, or yeah, the CFG files and how to edit them, what goes where. So hope you enjoyed it. We will see you next time. Take care, everyone. It goes, Holy wow, that's a crosswind. Holy cow. I wonder if I could pit maneuver you.